Hello and welcome to the second episode of Ask Keith Mills. Thank you very much for sending in all of your questions. Fantastic response, really, really pleased with it. So we've got a lot to get stuck into. Let's go. Question one. DJ Roman wants to know, in his drum mix, he's got the snare and the kick playing, but when the kick drops out, the snare is getting too loud. Why is this happening? And what can he do about it? Okay, so it sounds like the problem is some kind of compression or limiting going on here. So you've got your kick and your snare playing on top of one another. That's really driving, let's say, your compressor on your drum bus really hard. When the powerful kick drops out, there's not as much compression being applied. And so the snare all of a sudden is louder because it's not being reduced by the compressor. The solution to this is take your entire drum mix take all of your compression, everything off of it, and resample it to an audio file. Once you've got that audio file, you can turn the compressor back on and use the audio file as a sidechain input. So just to summarize, you're gonna have all of your drums still driving the compressor, but they're coming from an audio file now that's going into the sidechain input. Now, when you take your kick drum out of the mix in your actual track, the compressor is still being driven exactly as it was before and you won't get your snare all of a sudden popping out and smacking you in the face through your speakers. Okay, question two. Kelvin Dominic says that he's got two tracks signed at the moment and an offer for a third, but can he make a living out of music production or is it only ever going to be a side project? Hi Kelv, how's it going? Good to hear from you buddy. Well, I think absolutely you can make a great career still from music production. There are two main routes that you might go down. The first one is if you want to get into the DJing live gig side of things. So you can think of your music really as a business card or like a flyer to advertise your services. Now you are going to need to get into self-promotion, you're going to need to get into Facebook and all the other social media sites. It's a big part of it now, but consider that the more people that like your music and the bigger followers you get the more attractive you are for people to be booked for gigs if you've got a big following there's a good chance you're going to start filling out venues and there is a lot of money in the live side whether that's DJing or live performance the other route if you don't want to step into the limelight is you can consider work such as ghostwriting and producing for existing DJs a lot of money to be had there and also Right now, it's a flourishing market for things like writing music for films or television or even computer games. So there's plenty of work out there. You can absolutely make a career out of it. You're doing fantastically releasing the tracks that you are at the moment. Keep at it, buddy, and you do really well. Question three is from Ray Gill. Ray asks, how do you determine the root note of a track? When I'm coming up with an idea, I don't start by picking a root note, I just produce. Well, Ray, I'm gonna turn this one on its head for you and I'm gonna suggest that you do pick a scale when you start your track. It's gonna be much, much easier for you. And there are a couple of other advantages here as well. First of all, it allows you to set the tone of your music. So if you're gonna aim for something that's perhaps a little bit dark and melancholy, you might wanna go for a minor key if you're looking for that happier vibe, a major key and so on. The other thing is if you already have an idea of the instrument that you're gonna use, maybe it has a particular sweet spot. So perhaps if its root note was starting at C, it would sound a lot better than if it was starting at F, for example. So there are a couple of factors to consider. Now, once you're writing the track, you've already started in a scale. Maybe you find you're adding some new instruments and they're not quite fitting that scale. If you know what all of your instruments are doing, it's gonna be easy for you to just transpose them up and down a little bit You'll know exactly where you are, and it still gives you that flexibility, but it's a much, much easier way of working than starting out and then trying to figure out all the different bits and how they might join together. Okay, the next question is from my good friend, Rich Weller. Rich wants to know, what is the best way to do parallel compression? I've seen a number of different methods, including using compressors that have dry wet controls, duplicating channels, grouping, etc. What do you recommend? Hi Rich, how's it going buddy? So for me, it's the classic send and return system because it's nice and flexible. 
it lets you bus any one of your tracks to the same compressor and obviously you can have them at varying different levels. In addition to that, you can obviously follow the compressor with any audio effects that you like. So maybe it's an EQ to scoop out some of the low mids, a bit of coloration from some saturation, for example. Now there is an exception to this. If I was working on a specific sound that I wanted to have a set of controls that really didn't match the compressors that I've got set up on my return tracks, and it's just literally that one compressor for one sound, then I would go down the road of using it as an insert and using a compressor with a dry wet control. At the end of the day, it's whatever you feel is best, whatever you enjoy using the most. There's no hard and fast rules with it, but those are my preferences. I hope it helps. Take care. Okay, so that's it for this episode. Thank you very much for watching. Remember, if you've got any questions you want to ask, just fire them over to me on Instagram and Twitter using the hashtag AskKeithMills, or alternatively, you can type it into the contact box underneath this video. All the best, take care, and I'll see you soon.